Welcome to round two of the Help Pre UADC 2017. Um, my name is Mivzal, we are chair for this round. Um, so, in government, we have Help A, in opposition, we have IIUMA. Uh, which motion are you guys doing? Sorry? Okay. okay, so the second motion. Um, can I ask what was the Gulf veto? Uh, we vetoed the last one. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I call to order. Like invite the honourable prime minister to begin this debate. Here, here. Drugs are the most horrible and worst to the people who can't afford it. They're always caught in a trap that they can never escape. And this is where the understanding of how welfare comes in and what welfare really is for. So in our mechanism, we state that the welfare states as a complex take control of every individual in their state. That they, and when these people don't become contributing members of the state, the state has a responsibility to get them out of this drug trap. So how does this then come into play? Welfare recipients need to be tested and will be forced into rehab if they are found with uh, as drug users. And and if they continue enjoying, if they want to continue enjoying the welfare, they have to opt into rehab and nothing else. We will force all them to go into rehab. And how, so then let's understand as to what sort of countries uh, do to do this uh, mechanism uh, explores. It's Sweden, Netherlands, and Norway. So all these kind of states is where these people need to be going. Uh, need, uh, this is where the context lies. So when understanding about how why are drug users so bad, especially for people who cannot afford it, it's because of us. There will be no incentive to change. It's a very redundant cycle of how states have to allocate our uh, welfare, they have to allocate funds to these people, especially the poor. Happiness negates being productive and being constantly under this state of illusion, happiness means they'll, they'll never be able to get off the track, understanding where they really are and where they really stand in society. And we want to characterize welfare states, as we say, socialist and communal states, where it functions on collective effort and how these states really care about these people. So we understand that when it comes to living standards that do not rise for these poor people and welfare that is not good enough for them to be able to continue with their lives, we believe that states should have the responsibility to extend the, the understanding of where states' responsibility really lies in living standards of people under welfare. We believe that people who are not being an active contributing member to a state means that they have to be contributing because first, the states are already taking care of them to an extent where they should be. But more so, these people and these poor people cannot really live under welfare happily and will not be able to rise to living standards. And this is states' responsibility to do so. Welfare is to alleviate the suffering and to help other people with the tax money, for example. So when these poor, when these poor wealthy people eventually rise up to their ranks because of state's welfare, they then pay tax to help alleviate more of other people who are poor. And this, and we believe that these leeches will then be so, slowly diminished under this state's care and becomes a communal fund or goal for all for everyone to be able to rise up to the ranks and become a productive member of society. Because we understand that the principle of consent is a consent to the first part, to the first inhalation yeah, of yeah. what drugs are. They do not consent and there's no informed consent with addiction. Why? The understanding that the first part of first uh, the first part makes you feel really good. It makes you feel like you're in heaven on cloud nine. But the thing is, you do not consent to understanding of how this heaven and cloud nine will be toxic to you and how this environment yeah, yeah. is essentially going to make you live in an illusion of happiness that you will never be able to achieve real happiness or real productivity within a state. How? Because addiction is not something that every person understands when it comes to taking drugs. Understanding that drugs are a very peer pressure and friendly thing in the initial stages and only becomes toxic to you in a later stages of life. This clashes with the, with the understanding of how drugs are concerned and everything. The thing is, it's state's responsibility to alleviate addiction, especially when it clashes with goals of state. This is because everything that state has to make you do or make you a productive member of society to be able to make you fulfill your life to an extent where you'll be able to um, alleviate your suffering even further without state's help. 
because states can never be there for you forever. The fact that it will be more expensive for the state, it will be less productive for you, means that you will never become a fulfilling member of society. And we believe that in these communal states, there needs to be every person's participation to the maximum extent. Hence, this means that if states do not give them this uh, like the rehabilitation or the option of rehabilitation to access these, these facilities and to force them to access the facilities that rehab is always given in these kind of states, it's diminishing states' responsibility to ensure that they're improving their lifestyle. They're not fulfilling it to the maximum as a state. And we believe that welfare then really is to help the person to the maximum. With this principle, it is then going to be pushed away in every state and it's more likely for people to go under rehab and to be more productive members of society and get the help that they need from the state. Yes. In the existing welfare system, a lot of people get help when they're capable. Isn't it also true? A lot of the vulnerable groups belong from racial minorities, geographically disenfranchised communities, yeah, who cannot get it even if they want. The thing is, they can with this because it provides more accessibility for people. When the when, when states are then testing out for every person that is under their welfare, they have more statistical data and graphs of like who is more vulnerable to these groups or who will be the more vulnerable to drugs. The thing is, we believe. That sure that it's probably more prominent in like poorer places in a welfare state, but most of first these places are very rare. And second, welfare states eventually will be able to get gather statistical data and improve <coughs> your lifestyle overall. This gives more states leverage and data to be able to improve everyone's lifestyle. We talked about how this is a communal state and their principles are very socialist and communal. Hence, it is very important for every person to participate in the maximum extent. Then that comes to the third party of being under the yeah, influence yeah. of drugs and everything. First, let's understand the, the, the family's structure and the institution, right? So this means that when people become unproductive, they will not be able to care for people under their custody or care. This means more people will be able to suffer and the utilitarian benefit will not be able to exceed or proceed under their case when maintaining status quo. We believe that with we have more people will be able to realize what they're doing wrong and be able to uh, come back to go back to being a responsible adult or a responsible uh, member of society and family. Third, second is peer pressure. Let's understand how welfare states and how these people who are connected to each other. Their contact is closer and more unregulated. Why? Because these people who are under drugs will, will influence other people to take more drugs because they feel happy and they say that I don't want to face the, the reality alone. I want people to be with me, and this is our group and our herd mentality when facing struggles. We don't, people, these kind of people don't understand that what they're doing is essentially bad to them because they believe that they are happy and they believe that they're in a good place, that the state takes care of them, and that's all they have to do. The thing is, this is bad because it influences more people to be drug abusers and drug abusers. More so, the state they cannot then fully understand, fully help people to be able to gather them into a place of safety. And third, these children, the more hurt and the absence of a guardian is really bad for them. These people need their care and state responsibility extend to all the third party arms that exist. Hence, we have to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to the Prime Minister, I invite the leader of opposition to give yeah, yeah, yeah. you <laughs> <coughs>
The amount of people who would like to and who are addicted to drugs are pretty very minute. And most drug users want to quit drugs. And actually, this is a very, very nice idea that we will deliver. I don't think so. I'm going to break that down. There are two things about case, firstly, that I want to say before I go into my two issues. Number one, principally, why it's wrong to deny welfare with the drug and make things far worse. And secondly, how this resolution becomes incredibly discriminatory towards racialized minority groups. The first thing that I want to point out is that a lot of the cases is flawed. And now I'm telling you how drugs are bad for you. With that to you wholeheartedly. The question of this debate is how do you fix that drug problem? The second thing is that apparently they said this is a debate about priority and efficacy, but this debate apparently also happens in Norway where there's more than enough resources to cater towards these people, even if we give towards everybody in the first place. So I don't understand what exactly that problem is. Let's break down a few things. So, number one, why does it make things worse? So, the first thing we have to understand is that individuals are going to opt out. And we have to understand that a large majority of the and practically those most vulnerable are going to opt out. So he says, oh, the only a minute number are going to opt out. But the reason why that can't be true, sit down, is that you have to understand if these individuals wanted to quit anyway, then they would also commit to those rehab programs yeah. under outside because they would have no problem with it. Therefore, this debate necessarily falls down to the people who would have opted out because for the other large majority of people that they want to opt out, they would have taken welfare anyway. Why are these people going to opt out? There are three main reasons that's going to happen. The first thing is that you have to understand from all the characterization that they gave of drugs, that it's so incredibly that addicting, that your brain on cocaine can only see cocaine and heroin, means that you're willing to forego basic necessities like food as long as it means that you can get the next hit. And that, that means that if you think that going to welfare means that you're not going to get your next hit of cocaine, you're not going to go to welfare. You are going to stay addicted to drugs, and that's incredibly harmful. The second reason is that your support structure is based on drugs. So your friends, your family, everything sit down to you is based on this drug world. You buy from your best friends who are the people pressure you not to go. That means abandoning your life. And that very nicely leads into the third reason that most of those economic reasons are the most people who do find some sort of side income in drug pushing means that they would have to give that up anyway. And that means they're heavily disincentivized from ever going to a welfare system that will force them to give them up, right? What does that mean? It means that under their world, people are far more likely not going to go to welfare. And they will often opt for the alternative to survive, i.e. pushing drugs or falling even deeper into drug usage. And that's kind of the case for our world. Let's go for the even if, right? Sit down. Let's say that we do go into rehab and this rehab is so magical as we say. The first thing you have to understand is that forced rehab is so incredibly ineffective, right? Because as even as much as you force these people to go to meetings, their brain is still incredibly good on drugs. You always say, right? You have to want to quit drugs. That's the first thing. The second thing is that no, they'll come to you full of drugs that will make you not want to have drugs. That does not exist. Let's get that very clear, right? If there was a drug that made you not want to have drugs, Shita would not be addicted to smoking anymore because he's tried to quit 40 times. Comparative inhibitors don't exist. Or drug inhibitors don't exist. What does exist, and what I think they're going to be trying to talk about, is they wean you off the drug slowly so that you don't undergo intense withdrawal, right? So they give you slower and lower hits of cocaine or heroin, for example. But that doesn't stop the addiction if you don't want to stop that addiction in and of yourself because you still feel and you're still thinking about that same hit. So even after rehab, you go back and see, you, know, you fall into those same patterns of drugs and you still want to have that same drug again. So your brain chemistry doesn't necessarily change on the long term, it's just something temporary. But the fourth reason that, that rehab, the magical rehab doesn't work is because the problem of drug use is something that's systemic, right? It's just it's your support network, it's your friends, it's sit down, it's who you're with, it's your new version. Once you go out of rehab and you fall back into that same system, you'll still make you'll still go back into drugs to begin. So I don't think your method is very effective. Secondly, and and and, and you have to understand, right? Secondly, this goes into all this principle about how it's wrong, because ultimately that's what they're doing, right? Sit down. About how it's wrong to deny people welfare based on drugs, because ultimately, on a drug test, because ultimately, that is what they're going to be doing. There's two main reasons for that. The first reason is that the reason why people often fall into those drugs usage is something of a state failure. 
because of the fact that the state couldn't curb him and sit down, couldn't stop all these people who do push drugs upon them or who have massive amounts of peer pressure, or the fact that they secondly feel like they have to opt into this because they feel like there isn't that welfare system isn't enough for them. So secondly, and secondly, oftentimes it's, not, it's a, oftentimes a lottery of birth where there's just a lack of knowledge and education, or these people live inside extremely poor racialized minority communities, and therefore we think it's extremely principally wrong to force these people to do so. Something that very kindly talked about, we still have to have a response, and I think if we get it from government, it'll be extremely late. Before I go on to my second mission, yes. Speaker, the point is, what is the comparative here? We both agree that drugs are very harmful. We just choose to do nothing about it? No, no, no. So I think that it's better on the comparative for these individuals to at least go to welfare, even if they're still taking drugs, because that at least means they have, they're comparatively more likely to use those food coupons to sustain them for food, for example, and then they're at least able to survive. Or let's say they do decide to want to quit drugs one day, they are far more likely to pop into those rehab programs because they're used to welfare, for example. Or if they one day decide on their own that I don't want to take, take drugs anymore, they can't opt out of those economic pressures on their friends because they have the support system that is the state. That doesn't happen under your side where they decide to opt out of it completely. Yeah. Why do you think that it's up, sit down, it's going to be discriminatory to racialize my so we have to understand that inevitably this is going to discriminate those who are most racialized. And the reason for that is that, like it or not, those poor communities are oftentimes the ones who are also the minorities. What does that mean? I think that means that the same way that the police will subconsciously racially profile neighborhoods who are the poorest of communities, the same thing will happen with welfare officers who are more likely to deny those individuals based on race due to that subconscious bias that they have once you see that there are massive amounts of drug deaths. And if you think this doesn't happen, it happens on a very large societal scale, it happens all the time, right? Even if it doesn't happen very overtly. That means that there's more incentive for society to deprioritize the parts of neighborhoods because they think this neighborhood is something that's full of drug users and drug pushers, and therefore, why are we wasting our money on them? And that necessarily means that the people who suffer the most are the third parties who aren't necessarily addicted to drugs, but they get the part of it. The same way that in a black person who doesn't commit a crime, all the, 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 they, they are racially targeted. The same way that this happens under for, for these individuals. For those reasons, I'm very proud. Thank you very much um, to the deputy of the opposition. I invite the government to get here. I think the central goal of this debate and the central problem of this debate is that drug addiction is actually a really big problem that ought to be solved. We have clearly told you that at the point in which we don't give you welfare, say for example, monetary benefits or probably even a house, you then have less money to actually buy drugs. Does that act as an incentive for you to find rehabilitation which outside provides? Opposition did not prove how exactly people will actually go to rehab status quo and it never actually showed you how status quo actually helps people to get better. So three issues that shows why the other side loses this debate. Firstly, they are failing to recognize the intentions of why states give people welfare. Secondly, how the other side does not provide the incentive to change. And thirdly, how the other side further harms the identity of drug users. So let's look at the intention of giving welfare. So there's a lot of this thing that they kept harping on, which was that it's always the state's responsibility to give welfare and uh, Sharif came out and said it's just principally wrong not to give it. We agree that obviously, right, it's always the state's intention to give welfare, but there are different intentions. So at the point in which a state gives you welfare, it's not that they don't really don't intend for you to get hooked by the welfare for life. The welfare that they give you are often 
for you to help you in the point in time that you want to find a job somewhere else, right? Because if you don't have money, how else are you going to go around the country finding for a job that you can find on? Those, like, we, it's problematic when these kind of people use the benefits to buy more drugs just to fulfill their short-term desires and not provide any other kind of utility that was in the intention of the government when they gave you the welfare anyway. But the other solution to this was, let's not just talk about monetary benefits, let's just talk about something else. But they fail to are they ignore the argument that we give you, it's the unfairness in which the welfare is being given to people. So at some point in time when the state gives you like, uh, like a community home to stay in whatsoever, the state gives you that home for you to maximize your utility back. So like they give you a free home to stay, in response the state would probably envision for you to find jobs somewhere else and not spend so much of your spare money on buying a home. But the point is, if you do give this kind of drug users, they're probably just going to use the place and use it for drugs uh, to, to just take drugs whatsoever, right? And all the third party harm that Alex told you was conveniently ignored by their side. But this is also, I, I find this really funny, right? They argue that it is the state's failure to prevent people from using drugs. First, ignoring the characterization that we showed you, that these are normally really good, like really high state level uh, countries where normally education is given. But secondly, even if these kinds of state are as bad as what they told you, just because the state failed, we are not making an active effort to actually help them not take drugs anymore, right? That's why we are taking this policy to try to incentivize them to take to, to take active measures to actually not take drugs anymore, right? So that does not make that the valid argument outside provides better intention to welfare. But second, let's talk about incentives to change. Because we gave a lot of examples on why this is actually a good push for people to take for change. Their only response was people will opt out because if they wanted to change, they would take rehabilitation anyway. That does not really happen like that, right? Because you have to understand the nuance of our policy is that this is a state sanctioned act to actually actively help you get out of drug addiction. This means that the states are taking an active stance to help you, and that means that the stigma that people always associate the, like, that the state with uh, stigmatizing people take drugs are significantly reduced over here. That means people are still more likely to take it as well. But even if you don't buy that, we argue that that does not mean states must remove the liability to help these people. But I also find this really funny, right? No, thank you. They argue that what then makes people want to like not stop taking drugs, right? Because we need to understand that these people that we are talking about, the only reason why they are taking welfare is because they are already significantly poor at the point in time they take the welfare. Therefore, if they want to continuously get that welfare, they will just stop taking the drugs and find methods to help themselves, right? Because obviously they want that. But then they argue forced rehabilitation is bad, it won't work, it's a systemic Problem. Firstly, again, I don't think that just because, like, I don't think it means that states should just remove their responsibility. But secondly, there's like a difference. If you don't, like, obviously, if you don't force them to take rehabilitation, and if they don't go to rehab, there are going to be more people uh, being addicted to drugs under your side as opposed to outside, right? Even if we force them, there's still a marginally better opportunity to reduce the amount of people that are addicted to drugs. So that's still much better on our side. We also provide that incentives to change as well. We find one show. You have spent over 15 minutes talking about how dangerously addictive and effective yeah. drugs are. Then you tell me by a snap of a finger, a lot of people will be cured. How is it that a minute number of people will be traded off when a lot of these people will find it extremely difficult to wean off? Wait, wait, wait. I was arguing like on a literal scale over here like literally, right? Like you can't just assume that we recognize obviously helping people to not get addicted to drugs is something that is pretty hard, but at least we are taking an active effort, but more importantly, even if at the point we are not really successful, marginally lesser people could get addicted to drugs, right? You save zero here, even if you save one over here, that's still a benefit we are willing to take. So let's talk about the identity of drug users. Because they, the main contention from their side is it's discriminatory because it singles out a certain minority, ignoring the nuance coming from our side, that this was a very policy that can help these groups of people as well. If your concerns are that minorities are suffering, your policy creates even more stereotype for the minorities. There will be a stereotype that people of that particular race 
cannot opt out of drug addiction because it's an inherent part of the culture. Those kind of nuances are incredibly racist and wrong. Those kind of things would be perpetuated on their side, but you can't move them out of drug addiction. As opposed to our side, people have greater opportunity for all the reasons we have told you to opt out of drug addiction. That means that there will always be a perception when people see the change in people that these kinds of people can actually change, these kinds of people are actually good. A famous example of this is the obviously the opium war in China and how the large rehabilitative methods did change the perception of the Chinese people not being totally hooked on drugs in the 1920s. So that's far better on our side because we remove the stereotypes. But then they argue that it's not how people find solace in. I think their side worsens it because there's no other option because all they think about is using the benefits to get the solace they want, which is artificial. Thank you very much. Um, to Yaman Grid, I invite the opposition. Yeah, sure. This debate would work for them if every drug addict was this Norwegian drugger who thinks drugs simply <laughs> for blissful purposes. They never got out of that bubble, right? I probably don't need to give you more reason for me to But I'll give you three more. One, why do states provide welfare and which side provides a better ranking? The second one, how are individuals likely to behave? A very key part of their case, which they didn't explicitly engage in drug addict all time. Right? And the third thing that we would engage, the, the third thing that we, we bring to the table is the fact that welfare should never depend on any of those things and drug testing is just categorically wrong. And they never also engage with that fast part of the So, on to the first question. Why does the state provide welfare? Their assertion is, state provides welfare because they want to maximize productivity. But that doesn't make any sense when we know that state provides welfare because welfare of citizens is the primary goal. Because state recognizes that as a baseline of quality of life that everyone needs to be able to be. But I told you how the absence of that is dehumanizing, right? It also doesn't make sense because in that case, state should not just be providing welfare, but they should also be telling you, oh, this is the money you get to get this degree, take this technical education, do this, do that. State never adds any of all of those conditions all of those conditions to welfare in the first place is because that is never the point of welfare. State has a million of other things to maximize productivity. And at their side, state can literally force the citizens to do anything and everything they want, so long it meets their baseline annual level of productivity, right? So that's the first question that they never resolve. It's much more likely that state needs to it's just much more important the state needs to, to take care of the most vulnerable, and that's why we have a welfare system as a support structure, as the last net of benefit for the most vulnerable, right? They never engage with that. But the second thing that they said is, oh, but your state should never provide welfare to drug addicts because it's unfair to others, right? But that also doesn't make sense because in that case, welfare system would never cater to people who either oppose differing views or do not oppose, do not hold majority views. So in the case of a Muslim family, right, who may not be okay with a lot of jobs that are around them, in that case, they should be making their welfare free position and then taking all those jobs. Or a different uh, person, right? In that case, the state should be making welfare condition of them moving off to the city, which is more likely to maximize the chances of getting a job, but chances of improving their lives and improving lives of their fellow citizens. So the reason we never attach any of those conditions is because we recognize the point of view which we do give you welfare, we also recognize that you have your beliefs and you also have your vulnerabilities. Especially when you are from a vulnerable community, we do not attach additional conditions. Rather, we give you welfare so that you are able to take yourself out of that vulnerable community, right? So that is that's a far better way of doing. That's a far better way uh, of doing. That's a far better way of doing things, right? So this is this is 
Bani extensively talked about this. When she talked about why we add certain terms to welfare and do not add certain terms. So we are okay with, for example, if you think this person is a drug addict, instead of giving cash to us, give this person coupons, right? Or we are okay with, what, for example, adding the means that you cannot have welfare for more than four months to this amount. We're going to reduce it if you do not get yourself a job. That is okay. That's like that's that's a whole different class of conditions versus conditions that go like categorically as long as we find you're a drug addict, categorically as long as you find you're not willing to do X, Y, Z, we're simply not going to give you welfare, right? That's our first question. Like, why does the state provide welfare? They never responded to all of these really important questions that we had in the debate. The second question is the debate therefore becomes how are individuals more likely to be? See, this is really important because the entire case is contingent on most individuals opting into their policy. On which is it? opting into their policy, which doesn't make sense because of three categories of cases. The first one being these individuals still don't have the willingness or they still don't have the willingness or, or the faith in the system to really participate in it. It means even if they do participate in it, they're just much more likely to be that, right? But the second thing is when they do go back, they go back to the same environment. The African American still goes back to the same environment. The person from downtown still goes back to the same environment. None of those things changes. The second thing we told you is we didn't have to look at mutual speech, right? It was very effective at proving why people who are good to drugs probably will never go back. And we have repeatedly talked about it. If drugs are uber effective, and if you do really live a life that's like from one thing to another, and everything else in life sort of vanishes in the background, it doesn't make any sense why an individual will probably opt into your policy, but it is getting the individual out of welfare, right? This is only provided the third class of these right? Okay. When we told you that it's actually really easy for individuals not within the welfare system to sustain a drug habit outside the welfare system because they have fears that can help them support, to, so that can help them to sustain their habit. Secondly, often they can simply become small time drug pushers, right? They don't have to become like, uh, like, like huge Colombian drug, drug lords who have just enough drugs to sustain their drug habits, right? To sustain their drug habits. So finally, this thing simply cannot happen under big guys where people simply take drugs just for the hell of it, right? This is where the third question of the debate becomes really important. Is there more than one factor that leads people to taking drugs that should, is that important or not? That's exactly what we told you three things, right? The first thing is, you have to look at the individuals who take drugs. These are not simply individuals who are looking for a more blissful life, rather these are individuals who are vulnerable. These are individuals who are excluded. But you extensively talked about how these are vilified these are individuals who cannot get help. Given that these individuals are so vulnerable, and the point of a welfare policy is to help the vulnerable individuals, we, don't, we tell you it's categorically not right to exclude the most vulnerable group of individuals. That's the first thing we told you that they didn't engage you. Why these individuals should never be excluded. The second thing that we told you is the indispensable need of welfare. See, here's the thing. This site simply asserts that the point of welfare is to maximize productivity. We have a lot of other reasons to believe it really isn't the case, but we give you reasons to believe why that isn't the point. We told you the point of welfare is to create that base lifeline that makes you feel like a human being, right? The, the base lifeline that makes you you're not structurally disenfranchised, and all of those things have never been engaged with. But the third thing we told you was extremely important. See, here's the thing. People who take drugs happen to be from certain communities, happen to be from certain places. It means that when you are from a certain race, you are more vulnerable. When you are from a certain social economic class, you are more vulnerable. When you live in a certain region, you are more vulnerable to drug, to drug habits because it's more easily available to you, because you can easily get away with it, you can easily sustain that habit, you can even live outside the welfare system and keep sustaining that habit. That's the third thing we told you, that we really need to look at the fact that drug habit and the vulnerable communities are the entire communities that have been systematically disenfranchised by the state structure, right? And the point of which the mitigation factor is so huge, the point of which is such a huge failure on part of the state. You simply cannot say the state can be punitive towards these communities with the fact that these communities have created this habit due to the failure of the state to begin with. Welfare is not so black and white. It's supposed to improve life of people. It's supposed to make you feel human, provide you the basic necessities. You simply cannot take it. Thank you very much. Um, we go with, uh, sorry, opposition with, I now invite the opposition reply speaker. Okay. Thank you. I just want to point out how incredibly unengaging from the very get go. So, the first thing you have to understand is where exactly does this debate happen? Does it occur in the 90% of the cases that we want to talk about? Or the 10% of the cases I am in all way Sweden? And the thing is that we're still willing to engage in that base case scenario where your rehab is incredibly good, 
where you can find these people where you know this is just the best case scenario, but they weren't willing to engage in our large majority of cases. Right? That's a failure on the next side. I think when a large majority of their rebuttal just boils down to, oh, this is Norway, we can do it. That's not a very that's not really analysis, guys. I think it's a large concession that in 90% of these cases this policy will fail. That's why I'm getting the there's a lot of accusations that there's no alternative under our side. When we told you, and from my speech, we told you that as long as we get them into welfare, that's the most important thing to begin with. Because you have to understand, but he said we can give them food, we can give them employment benefits, we can give them education. And that's incredibly important because that's how you get out of drugs to begin with. All those side and salary things are, are, are our alternatives, and that's extremely important. In fact, it makes zero sense when they say they'll use the money from welfare to buy drugs because we told you we don't have to give them cash necessarily, right? When we get drugs. So a lot of their arguments don't make sense. So when you recognize that getting there is the most important thing, that's when you lead to why is it that these individuals will then opt the power? Or what reason is there for individuals to opt in? Because you have to understand, right, from their side, we've got zero reasons as to why individuals who are addicted to drugs are being told you to would want to opt in. They told you that they're minority. But where's the analysis on that, right? Why would it be a minority? Just we failed to see why. The only thing we got was because it's welfare, these individuals have to eat and therefore they have to do it. Not analyzing the three reasons that we gave you. Number one, that drugs are just so incredibly on your brain that you are even willing to forgo things like food and welfare. Secondly, that you are going to find different alternatives, i.e. in your social network, you'll fall back on your friends. Or thirdly, this is just your economic support. So like the most, the majority of people who rely on a side income, for example, by becoming drug users to support that drug habit, also don't want to abandon that. Just means that individuals are going to opt down a their scenario. And that means that you don't get that alternative that you really want to. But even then, right, we were, we were willing to be nice to them. Say, even if individuals go, they never gave us a reason as to how is it that we have is going to work. Because the thing is that even if you force individuals to go to rehab, they said comparatively more people are going to rehab. But he didn't weigh that against the fact that less people are going to be opting into to welfare to begin with. So sure, more people are going to be opting into rehab of the people who take welfare, but less people are going to be taking welfare to begin with because they're opting out because they want to continue taking those drugs. And that's, I think, the comparative that he's missing in this debate. More than that, is all of the unengaging things about Ama arguing about how this will lead to more racialized communities and the perception that it will lead towards these individuals and how police or welfare officers will feel more justified in racially profiling something that already exists under the and I think we make it far worse. But secondly, is all of the principal argumentation we gave you as to how it's a lottery of worth and how oftentimes in circumstances. And the thing is that once you're hooked on drugs, right, you don't really choose anymore. So therefore, you're discriminating and disallowing these people from getting welfare for something that you concede that they didn't really choose to do anymore to begin with because they're so hooked on drugs because of their circumstances. And sure, maybe it's not a state failure in Norway, but in a large majority of circumstances, it isn't necessarily a problem of state failure. You do have to deal with that under their side. I think this is a large failure to deal with what happens under the 90% of cases that this debate does happen for those who are doing this debate. Thank you very much for um, your reply. I invite the government to reply. Thank you. I tell you what I am damn good at. I am just damn good at calling out arguments, especially calling out rehab magical and calling out world magical. What they weren't good at was actually defending money states from the get go. What money to do? This is why they would lose the debate. But you know what? I'll be kind of two and meter companies, right? She said that she'll be able to prove to you on the off more people will actually go to rehab because you need to confuse in the welfare and that's when like you feel like hey, maybe you said love me, I want to go to uh, get big welfare. And that case was offered to drop. But they continue to our line and they say, I'm going to make yeah, you're right, drugs are a bit predictive, we can't do anything about the loss cause. It's just that like, let them live life, right? It's okay. But then, okay, maybe what Rani <coughs> said in a one line, she's like, you know, we can just give them with love and I to be assumed, yeah, it's giving them like, like, you know, actual things like coupons and all of that. Um, bro, coupons can be sold. I can buy a rice cooker and sell it on the Like, I think if you, if we want the people, <laughs> are that addicted to drugs, like giving them anything would mean they'll be used. To my that money, right? Like, I saw my MPS coupons, it's not that hard. I'm trying to fix up the coupons too. It's not that difficult, right? So, but the contention, right? The serious part of the debate is when you give them things to, to continuously allow them 
to have a drug addiction and we both agree that they need addicted because they're not going to have up, then they will do anything and everything to get that drug. In comparing this, maybe that maybe you start seeing your matchas dying of starvation or st dying in the snow because they don't have shelter, and maybe you start seeing like everyone meet it up. Maybe, right? I think our uh, rehab is not so bad. I heard they're warm towers there, right? On a comparative, right? More people on our side will be willing to check into a rehab clinic. So even if it takes some deaths, people will often be incentivized. The comparative that you were missing is no one will be incentivized. If we both agree that drugs are addictive, you have to agree that you will continuously have a significant number of drug abusers. So this will lead me to the second reason why you agree, right? Is it fair for us to give universal welfare? Un, 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 unregulated, right? So I think if you give someone welfare and they go and use it to make a fake credit card machine or they go and make to buy a rope or uh, buy like you know a hammer to break into houses, that is strategically bad welfare and we would arrest you for that. So similarly, you think that welfare oftentimes is given for you to fulfill your first hierarchy of needs, right? Food, water, shelter. If you're not using for those direct reasons, because that is what the state is responsible for. The state is responsible for keeping you alive. If you're not enabling the state to continue the responsibility, we think it's fair for us to take away the welfare. Secondly, we also think if you're not in line with state's values, that is why we are able to, uh, if you are in prison, you no longer get these sort of benefits you get, right? Why? Because you weren't in line with state values. We think the principle is an extension here where we think that we are okay to change the world. The world need not be about the world today. We want to, if the debate needs to be about the world, we want to live in, right? In the world we live in, we are happy to posit to you that welfare state need and welfare needs to be given on a needs basis and only people that fit certain ideologies we are happy to push them with. But lastly, will this really have work, right? So just calling it magical does not mean it will not work. Like I think that there are many studies in Switzerland, in, in many Scandinavian countries, even in Denmark, that most people who do check in the rehab at least have experienced less of addiction to the drugs, at least have experienced some form of feedback, right? At the marginal level, like, you, you claim you engage in our best case, you don't, you just need to. We said that there will be some net benefit. Some people will finally get the, the urge to finally put off drugs. But what did they tell you? They said that they will never go there because they love these drugs so much, because they have a community backing them. We think that when you start suffering due to hunger and you start suffering due to not having shelter, right? We think that is a very important reason for you to start checking in and giving back the uh, welfare stamps, right? When the comparative is, I used to get mildly fed and I used to have a roof and now I don't have anything, right? Maybe drugs don't seem so important when cold water hits your face every day. But the comparative we told you, we said we have pressure in three levels, right? We also told you that because when you start at some initial level of stigma of people to pressure you to go into this rehab centers. We believe that at least on our side, more people would go to the first door of rehab on a comparative of continuing the Thank you very much. Um, the government replies, thank you so much for both themes across the floor. Big hands made up the side of the result. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.